Eric. Hey, Charles. How, how are you doing? doing? Great, man. We're laying down next rocks. Yes. Yes. What's going it's on? Wonderful. Okay, so here we are with kind of you know with three academics. Um, let me see Spersky. Indeed. Carl Hewitt. Yeah. And Hello. what we're going to do is we're going to talk today about actors. Everything yeah. you always wanted to know about actors, but were afraid to ask. Excellent. We can now yeah. ask the questions to the guy that invented actors. Yes. Because actors, people talk <laughs> about actors here, actors there, but they use it in a very informal sense. Right. But Carl has, you know, has a very kind of you know precise meaning of what an actor is, and that's what we're going to kind of you know suck out of his brain today. <laughs> and the Clemens is going to help me with that. We'll suck. Yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> do a good job of it yes. too. Right. right. On. Okay. So, 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 Carl, what is an actor? It's not somebody that's kind of is in a TV show or like us right now. No. Right? No. The, the the actor is the fundamental unit of computation. As the fundamental of unit of computation, it has to embody three things. Okay. It has to embody uh, processing, because you've got to get something done. Okay. It has to embody storage, because you have to be able to remember things and store things. And, and it has to be able to embody communications. So an actor is the fundamental unit, the primitive unit, that embodies all three essential uh, elements of computation. I made a mistake here, sorry. Okay. I started to count with one. Yes. <laughs> okay. You're getting old. Yes, uh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Okay. Too long out of the Netherlands, you know. It's like, you know, yeah. Dijkstra is kind of, you know. Yes. Yeah. So, so now, okay, so this is great. So an actor embodies these three things. Now, yes. people often kind of, you know, when, when they talk about actors, they talk about, like, you know, mailboxes and message queues and concurrency and right. locks. And so, um, how does that fit into this picture? Right, that's a very good question. Um, the first thing is that um, we have to be reminiscent of E.O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson famously said, said that one ant is no ant, right? Well, one actor is no actor. They come in systems. Yep. And so they have, in order to come in systems, they have to have addresses. Okay. So that one actor can send a message to another actor, and there's no reason an actor like Factorial can't have an address for itself. So that's the way you implement recursion. Okay. Okay. Then, but then the actors are very abstract, because beyond this, okay, all we have is certain fundamental properties of actors. For example, suppose the first property is that everything is an actor. Okay. And then you say, an actor has a mailbox. Well, a mailbox is an actor, so now the mailbox needs a mailbox. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this yes, is friend. a disaster. Yes. So now we're going down the rabbit we're hole. We're going down the rabbit hole. That's right. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so where does the recursion end? With the axioms. Okay. Good axioms. I love That's that. Right. Yes. I love sure. axioms. Very solid. Yes. Yes. So what are the axioms? So the first actors, axiom right? is when an actor receives a message. Okay. Now I'm well, using kind of, yeah, yes. axioms, I'm using axioms, kind of, that's uh, right, yeah. Roman numerals. What for can that. it do? All it can do is it can create some more actors. It can send messages to actors that it has addresses before. And it can say, it can designate what it's going to do with the next message it receives. And that's it. <laughs> Everything else has to be done out of that. Mm. Okay, so the third thing again? Just the third thing is you designate what you're, how you're going to handle the next message you receive. Okay, good. That is, does that have that something to do with continuations? Uh, well, no, because continuation was an old idea for the von Neumann machine. Ah, continuation okay. is the lambda expression that you execute after you finish doing the current one. Okay. So that's a that's a single threaded kind of idea. Okay. So this whereas whereas this 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 has to do with concurrency. See? If you're a checking account, right, and you have a balance of five dollars, you might receive a a, a, a a deposit message with six dollars. Now your balance is eleven dollars, yeah. right? So you say when I process the next message, I process it with a balance of eleven dollars. Okay. I don't change any of the names I have now. I'm just the change applies to the next message that comes in. Okay. So so then I, I have I have like a, a clarifying question. So here you say that you know so when how does because here it says you know you you, you kind of you know, decide or designate what you do with the next message, but this message loop here. 
No right? loop. Or uh, there's no loop. But where where is the kind of are, are can an actor run do things many things in parallel, or can it only kind of you know send messages to the other ones, create new ones, and and kind of you know okay. In now, now, now I'm looking first approximation. Yes. It processes as one message at, at a time. time. Okay, but. Implementers know how to pipeline messages yes. in certain cases, and in the case when you're in the case when you're going to process the next message, in exactly the same way you're processing the current message, somebody like Factorial, yep. you can do all of them at the same time. So Factorial can be processing mm -hmm. arbitrarily many messages at the same time. But but conceptually, you you kind of you know you process one message at a time, and that's then right. the implementation can kind of you know make that more concurrent. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Okay. So so is, is is that okay if I kind of write that down? Because sure. I'm, I'm looking right. for the yes. conceptual, the conceptual model, right? model. That's yes. right. So yes. we yes. are looking yes. for the conceptual model. So conceptually. Okay, so now, of course, the, the, the question is... I put an asterisk on that because the, the loopholes are large. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so I'll well, yes, right. quote it like that. So now the, the, the question is, what happens if an actor sends a message to itself? You know, maybe directly mm -hmm. or indirectly. Would it go into a deadlock? Well, okay, the next thing yes. you have yep. is, is, is the notion of a future. Ah. <laughs> okay, good. So future, we all have a future. We all have a, we hope. <laughs> right. Yeah. The idea of a future okay. is that you can create an actor for, for any result while it's, be, it's still being computed. You don't know whether it's finished computed or starting or whatever, but you can now have an address for something. Like when you buy a future for a bushel of wheat, okay, yes. then it's for a bushel of wheat not now, but in the future, okay. And if a drought happens, then the future will break and you will get an exception instead of a bushel of wheat. Well, okay. these futures are the same way, but they are actors, you pass them around. So for example, you say future a factorial of 100 million, and you think it might take a long time to compute the factorial of 100 million, but you get the future immediately. Okay. And you can pass it around, and you can store it, and you can send it in messages. So now, if hmm. you want to send yourself a message, you right? Back if you, 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 can, you, you can put the, 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 the message to be sent to yourself in this future, send it to yourself, and now you don't deadlock. Okay. <laughs> good. All right, so that sounds good. So, Clement. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm wondering, um, yep. if we um, designate what to do with the next message, um, how is that different from creating a new actor? Ah, because if I'm the checking account and I have a balance of five dollars and I get a deposit of six dollars, right? If I created a new doctor, a new actor with a balance of eleven dollars, that would be no good. I would have because to they expect the old actor to have a balance of eleven dollars. All right. So designating what to do with the next message is to is, is the next message to me. That's right. Yes, and 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 also I, I would say the the way I kind of look at that comments is that. Because I think where they say each actor, I didn't write that down, that each actor has an address that I can kind of, you know, talk send to, messages send to. messages to. So it's like, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if, the, if the actor was a chicken and I chop off his head, you don't get like a copy of the, of the, of the chicken without the head and the other one still has its head. So I think the, the actor actually kind of, you know. Yeah, so um, but the actors are yes. very powerful chickens. Yes. The actor has to agree to chop <laughs> off his own, own head. head. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very zen. Yes. So all you can do is send him a message saying, you know, please commit seppuku, <laughs> okay? Yes. And it can send back an exception saying, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> so would then the address of an actor be equivalent to its identity? No, Question. because you can have one actor, one address for a whole bunch of actors if you're replicating behind the scenes. Okay. And one actor can have many addresses okay. that forward to one another. Okay. So there's a many-to-many -many relationship among actors and addresses. And is actor identity discoverable? What would you think you mean by identity? If I hold... If you, can I if hold you, actors as values? No, all you have is addresses. All so you compare addresses. two addresses as to whether the addresses are equal or not, Mm -hmm. And that tells you nothing. <laughs> so then, how do I know, at any level of looking at my system, whether I have one actor or multiple actors behind an address? 
You cannot tell. I cannot tell. You cannot tell. Because, for example, when you do a search on Google, Google has one uh, Google address. Google.com, yeah. Right? It's not, it's, it's not the same Google everywhere who's processing your search request, right, even right. though you sent it all to Google.com. To, to, to Google, Google and the, the same is true for Bing, by the way. Thank same you. is true for Bing. He meant Bing. I meant Bing. Okay, I meant Bing. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're kidding. Right. Yes, of course. <laughs> that's just beta reduction, right? That, yes. that, that's right. Well, but, 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 but talking really. about that, <laughs> can you have two addresses that kind of, you know, have, that are kind of, you know, proxies to the same actor? Absolutely. So, right. Because one of them, you might have one actor that just forwards messages yes. to another actor, and you can't tell, okay, whether you're, whether you're talking to a forwarding actor, a proxy, or you're talking to, the, to, to, to somebody behind the scenes. Sure. Because all you can do with a message, uh, with an address, is send in a message, period. So now, now you can use encryption, encryption, and you can still do authentication. And if you create an actor and have an active an address of an actor you created, you can have a pretty good idea yes. who that is. So, so now I, I have a question about that, like, you know, to, to continue a little bit on sure. what, what Clement said. It's like, let, let's talk a little bit about these kind of, you know, addresses of actors and about where you say, you know, like, create more actors. Because mm -hmm. how can, you know, how can, the, how can you be sure that I don't kind of just cook up some address, you know, I kind of, you know, randomly generate something and I, I say, okay, now I'm going to send a message to this address that I cooked up out of thin air. So where do these addresses come from and how are these actors created? Okay, well, basically, uh, within a system, uh, like for example the CLR, which enforces uh, the address integrity, the integrity of addresses, you can rely on the CLR. Between the machines, you use encryption. So what you do for your address, you send it out, you encrypt it, and when it comes back, if it doesn't decrypt as one of your addresses, it's no good. Okay, so you're saying it's like in the CLR, I cannot take. If, if everything is implemented correctly, yeah. I cannot take an integer and kind of cast it to an object. That's right. Okay. And so, so in that sense, yeah. addresses seem to be like capabilities. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yes, yes. They, they, they are, in fact, you know, the, the, the original work by Dennis and Van Horn was one of the inspirations for the actor model. Except that they had a very kludgy way of doing it because they had no protection within an address space. Right. They had to put the, 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 the magic stuff out to the side and it was just incredibly awkward. If you can maintain the integrity of the, of the addresses, you get capabilities for free. An address, I think, is a much better name for, for a capability mm -hmm. because it indicates what you have the right to do, namely send it a message. Yes. That is the only and fundamental capability. The other, the other inspiration was the work that Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn were doing on the internet, okay, with packets. We say packets are nice, but we need messages. Mm -hmm. But these messages will be, obey the same rules as packets for efficiency reasons. So if I send Eric two messages in a row, I send you M1 and M2, you might receive M2 before you receive M1 because it's more expensive on the system to try to enforce that constraint. And that's why the US mail system says, if I drop two messages in the mailbox for Eric, he can get them. I drop one in today and the, the other. Usually that is the case, actually. Yeah, yes. right. <laughs> that's right. Drive <laughs> right. in random order. Yes, that's right. So, so, so let, let, let's talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to kind of draw the picture here. So we have two actors that, you know, let's say, actors A0 and A1, and, they, and let's say that this one sends messages to, to this one. Yeah. So you said that if this one sends message 0 and message 1, that they can arrive in any order. That's and right. That's, um, can, it, can messages be dropped? Can they disappear or are they always guaranteed it's, to arrive? It's best efforts. Best efforts. So best efforts. Now, so what does best efforts entail? Yes. Okay. Well, and, if, and, if, and if you're going across machines, if, 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 if you're going across two. machines, yeah. best efforts entails that, you, that you're going across machines so you'll persist it to some kind of stable storage. Okay. So that you can resend the thing if you don't get an act back for the acknowledgement back for the other thing. On the other hand, if you take this message and persist it, and a terrorist blows up this machine, the message is gone. <laughs> Even okay. though you persist it. But, 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 but <laughs> let, let's go back to the kind of basic axioms, right? Yeah. Because there right. we don't we didn't talk about like persistent and so on. So so the, the, in the in, in, in this kind of conceptual model. The, the messages are, you know, is this channel reliable or what, is kind of, what are the properties of the channels between the actors? 
There are no channels. Or channels. Or, and this or, is very okay. important. Good, sir. No, no channels. channels. No channels. Ah. No <laughs> overhead. <laughs> Get those you out talk of your head. directly. Yes. No okay. channels. You don't have to go through some intermediary called a channel. <clears throat> and unlike in things like communicating sequential processes and the process calculi and all those guys, okay. where you have to use an intermediary. The intermediary has a terrible problem because if you have two guys trying to get something out of the channel, okay, only one of them is supposed to get it. So you have to go through a large amount of overhead, like a, something uh, horrendous called a two-phase commit, <laughs> just to get your message, right? Yes. So the yeah. actors say, no, 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 this is very bare, bare bones. You can implement a channel, okay, with a put and a get message to it if you want one, but that's not part of the... Okay, okay. So a channel would be another actor. A channel, channel would, would be, be another, another actor. Okay, but... And suppose you wanted to actually sequence these two guys, okay? Yes. Well, then what you do is you make another actor called yes. a sequence... M0, M1, and you send the sequence to this guy. Okay, but I, I'm, I'm still so, so... And these I, two guys can be futures, so they can manifest themselves whenever they're needed. So I'm, I'm still, so I understand, I, I was, I, I'm, my uh, apologies for using the, the word channel, but I mean, yeah. whatever, there must be some kind of, you know, ether or whatever. Where no, it's just kind of photons, things, there's no ether. Or, or photons, but these things must communicate. So I, I was, I was looking for what yeah. are the properties of that, you know, of the communication right. between, in, 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 the, in the very abstract. So, so, so. So it tries very hard to deliver every message. But can it duplicate mm -hmm. messages? No, a message will be delivered at most once. At most, at most once. Okay, that's right. One or zero times, and in arbitrary order. And it could take a long time. If this message no goes through a mail yes. server in Timbuktu, it might be like one of these messages to Queen Victoria that's discovered behind a closet in the in the mail in the yes. post office when it's torn down and is delivered a hundred years later. Yes, or like you know, a message in a bottle kind of you know, floats but over that the sea. Flows over the sea. That's yes. right. Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah. And so another thing that you often talk about is non-determinism. And you already kind of talked about that when you, yeah. with channels, you know, that there are two people have to kind of get it out now, yeah. there's a race. So right. uh, how does, and, and arbiters, you know, yeah, that's right. another kind of yeah, yeah, beautiful right. thing. So how does that fit okay. in this picture? The first thing to do is- And this, these are, and that, yeah. just like these are that's not actors on TV, the arbiters are not like in a tennis match, right? They're, they're- the, the, they, That's right, they're not. Yeah. But, but the ones on the tennis match might be made out of these. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the ball is out! <laughs> that's right. Well, that's, that's, that's the thing about it. We'll get to it just a second. Yeah. The arbiter does decide, okay? Yes. And, and, and there's nothing before the arbiter decides. The, the arbiter actually... Did. Now, so we did want to distinguish between non-determinism and indeterminism. Okay. Non-determinism is what we got with the original Turing machine. That's when you flip a coin. Okay. You flip a coin, it comes up heads or tails. If it's heads, you go one way. If it's tails, you go the other way, right? So that's a kind of thing that you had on the Turing machine, the non-deterministic Turing machine, yep. and it's not sufficient, okay? Because it doesn't give you indeterminacy. Indeterminacy is what happens when things are just things are decided by, by working themselves out. It wasn't somebody flipped a coin to make a decision. It was how it worked out. Okay, how can this be? Well, if I'm sitting here sending my suppose I start off, I'm in a some very simple actor, I have a count of zero, and I start off and I send myself a start message and a stop message. Yep. Okay. If I get a, sorry, a go message and a stop message. So let's write this down. Yep. Go message and a stop message. Okay. And we, we, we come in with a start message. Yep. So when I get a start message, I send myself a go message and a stop message. If I go get a go message, I increment the counter by one and I send myself a go message. If I get a stop message, then I stop and report what the count is. Okay. Now, this is something that no non-deterministic Turing machine can do because this thing can stop with a count being arbitrarily large. Mm -hmm. It wasn't somebody decided how big the count was going to be. The size of the count was dependent on how long it took this stop message to arrive. Nobody ever flipped a coin. It was just how long it took. So this yeah. is a way where you move, okay, from non-determinism in non-determinacy to indeterminacy. 
And is, it, does that also have to do something with the fact that this message kind of, you know, is, is in some sense like, you know, out of, out of the system, that it kind of interacts with the environment and it's not like the closed it's kind of Turing closed, machine? It's not closed, right, because yes. that, that was, that, that was yeah. where we started off. Yes. That there, there's some, something called the state. Yes. The state of the computation which is fixed. Yep. And that's why it's possible to prove, and my colleague Gordon Plotkin gave a very nice proof of this, that if you have a state machine model of computation, then it has to have bounded non-determinism. Okay. Whereas this has a configuration model. We have the local state of this guy, okay. the count, but the configuration out here has a stop message that's traveling in photons. He's not sitting still anywhere. So this is a configuration-based model of computation, which is more powerful because it incorporates communication than the state-based approach. Yes, so, so, so that is an interesting thing. Like there's, there's some, like uh, recently, a lot of people think that like Turing machines are what defines uh, computability, yeah. but, but you're saying that really interaction with some kind of, you know, open environment is yep. kind of, you know, it definitely changes what a computation means because that is the difference between non-determinism and indeterminism. Is That's that right. correct? That is correct, yeah. And Robin yeah. Milner uh, cabbaged onto this in his Turing lecture in which he pointed to the actor model of computation as the insp inspiration for his starting to develop the process calculi. But there the emphasis was different. He was emphasizing, he wanted to have nice algebraic equations, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So he put in the channels so he could have his algebraic uh, equivalences, right? But the actor model didn't because the actor model wanted to remain faithful to physics as its touchstone, not algebra. And the physics says you don't put in an intermediary because it's a source and a necessary source of overhead. Mm -hmm. So th another model that's also inspired by physics is battery nets. So how do yeah. actors relate to battery nets? Uh, good question. Battery nets also did not relate to physics. So let me just briefly explain what a petri net is. So PetriNet is a, is, is a game played with tokens, and uh, what happens is you have things called places and transitions, and you can put pennies on the places. Yep. And if all if, if you have pennies on all the input places of a transition, this is the output place, you can take both pennies off simultaneously and put one penny on the output place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. We're going sort to of follow law, uh, Dijkstra and call upon the law of the excluded miracle. The excluded miracle is that these two pennies at different locations can both disappear at exactly the same time because this one might actually be the input place of another transition over here. And this one could be the input place of another transition over here. So you actually have to steal both of these at the same time, and the actor model will not let you do okay, that. Okay, so you're, in, in this case, you're saying these kind of tokens would be somehow entangled. Because that's they, right. And, you're, and that's something that you don't allow. Do not allow. Uh, okay. So in the actor model, can you not express synchronization? Uh, well. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. So what yeah. is your name? Yeah. Right, welcome. Okay. Welcome. Right. welcome. 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 Right. Right. Come around here. <laughs> yes, come around here. Okay. Why, why don't we push the table? Right. Yes. Hi, I'm sorry for barging in like this. No, that's okay. Yeah. Why, so, why don't you go, okay, go stand in front there? Of the camera. Right, here we go. Yes. Right, my, na my name is Shaz, and my question was, uh, um, the, what, what, uh, what you described about PetriNet is essentially synchronization, and you said that it cannot be expressed in the actor model. So I was wondering, can you not express uh, synchronization in, uh, in, in the actor model? Yeah, well, it would be a disaster if we could not, right? Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we already know yes. the end, but that we need to explain it. Yes. Okay. Let's think about the checking account. See, checking account is not something you can do in functional programming because the checking account is sitting here and there can be many parties out there, we don't know who, who's going to make the next withdrawal from this checking account yes, from some ATM someplace on the planet. So the way the actor de model deals with this is an individual actor processes one message at a time, mm -hmm. but it's indeterminate which message will withdraw, will, will arrive next. So you might have somebody in Tokyo who's depositing $7, while somebody in England is taking out $8, and it might only have a balance of $2, and it depends on which the order in which the messages arrive is indeterminate, and the outcome will depend on that whether you get your money or not. But in some sense, you're saying that the synchronization is kind of built into 
the rule that one message is handled at a time. That's, That's kind right. of the fundamental where, you know, the, the primitive point of synchronization. That's right. Yes. And that's where the arbiter comes in. Yes. Okay. Good. Because, because that's I, how, I love right. the arbiter. It's like the Muller C element. That's, that's right. My that's favorite right. kind yes. of. Yeah. You know, my favorite. Okay. So here I'm is a, here uh, is <laughs> the arbiter. Okay. And I have examples of this. Um, there's a very I should put in a plug. There's a very nice volume coming out, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the birth of of Alan Turing. Okay. Yep. Whose machine cannot do this. <laughs> <laughs> But we commemorate him because he was a great man, nevertheless. Yes. And. He liked tapes. <laughs> yes. And in there, I actually have pictures of some of these arbiters and examples in that volume. And you can already order it on Amazon.com. And Hector Zanil is the editor of okay. that volume. And Roger Penrose wrote the, the preface. Okay, so what's an arbiter? An arbiter is something that you cannot make out of straight AND gates and OR gates and other Boolean components. Okay. It has the following property. It has two inputs, I1 and I2, and two outputs, I1, O1, and O2. So here's the deal. You start off with both these zero. You're allowed to put in both of these at the same time, but only one of them will come out as a one. Okay? Only one of these things will rise from zero to one. Not both of them, just one. And so so the, the ball is in or the ball is out, but it cannot be both. It cannot be both. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, 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 so this is the magical, magical circuit. It consists of cross-coupled gates inside it. It's a very small thing. Our computers are becoming absolutely chock full of them. Our multiprocessor systems have them, which makes things indeterminate. And so now it's becoming more difficult to debug our programs because it used to be that we put the same input in and run it again and get the same bug. Mm -hmm. Now we put in the same input, okay, and it does something completely different because of all this indeterminacy inside. So, so can, I, can I ask uh, uh, um, two questions? Like one is like, isn't this thing kind of behaving like the flipping the coin? Where it says, you know, like the coin no. is like heads or tails? It's not. For one thing, it, can, it, 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 it we don't know how long it's going to take. When you flip ah, okay. a coin, ah, okay. So the, okay. So, the, so this can take arbitrary long to decide. Yes, but and, and that, but, that but in practice, it always yes. it's, it's 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 like it's like the arbiter at the tennis match. We said we were going to make him out of arbiters. The arbiter at the tennis match can take as long as he wants to make his decision whether the ball was in or out, but he must decide. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, but that is a very important property that it can take unbounded time to kind of That's uh, right. do that. But with an exponentially like decreasing reason. prob probability, so the amount of pro the probability that it hasn't decided yet goes down exponentially. So in practice, these things work just fine. Okay. And so my second question is like, if we if we if we look at these things, if you look at the network card inside your computer. Mm -hmm. And two kind of you know packets come in at the same time. Is there an arbiter kind of you know in your network card in your PC, or how does that work? How does that thing decide which message came in before? The there other is one? an arbiter, okay, but it's an arbiter between what's going out and what's going and what's coming in. It's where the arbitration is taking place, because the place where the arbiter was originally invented was when they took the Turing machine the von Neumann machine, and they hooked it up to the teletype. Because now you have a t terrible problem. Somebody presses a key, but the computer already thinks it knows which instruction it's going to execute next, right? So you, you, you want to have a, a piece of code to process the character and a piece of code to do what it was going to do before, and now you've just invented concurrency, and you need an arbiter to decide which piece, which, pro, which, which value the program counter to pick next? Is it going to be from the interrupt handler or is it going to be from the, the, the program that was running before? Yes, but, but this is interesting because you mentioned Dextra before, but didn't Dextra kind of you know, do a lot of stuff with interrupt handlers in the THA? Kind That's of, right, you know, he helped invent this. this. Yes, and, and, then, and then he forgot about it and then he it. And then ideology took its course. Ah, okay. He could not bring himself to believe in unbounded non-determinism. He said to himself, there must be some bound. <laughs> and then he convinced Tony Hoare. So in the first version of communicating sequential processes, the semantics specified bounded non-determinism. Now, unfortunately, this is a disaster 
for concurrent systems. Because if you're a server, and, 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 Clemens. and, and Clemens and I are both trying to send input to you, yes. right? If you can make an arbitrary choice, you could always choose me. Of course, I would. <laughs> of course, you would. Yes. Right. But with an arbiter here, you <laughs> yes. see, yeah. with an arbiter, which produces the unbounded non-determinism. So then in the second version of CSP, the semantics were changed because they wanted to be able to prove that, a, that you could actually make a server using CSP that would work and not starve customers. Okay. So this actually has a practical import to it. Okay. So so I, I'm I'm still fascinated by these addresses. Um, yes. Because like how do you kind of you know uh, because we said like and and about like the, the communication between two actors because how do you know how do you find you know because that is something you abstracted away from is that you know given an address how do you find the actual actor because like it, on the internet there's dns right you know if i have mm -hmm. the i can find the actual yes. machine how does that kind of, is or is that something that we don't need to know in this yes. kind of abstract right. here that's right so the actors are in fact very abstract any implementation that obeys the axioms is okay okay and, and so that, that's the achievement of abstraction, is, is, is to get up to the next higher level where you can work at a higher level and don't have to be concerned with lower level things like locks, like queues in front of you, your actors, etc. all these lower level implementation things. But then they, get, they also give, and this is the thing that's taken the, you know, so the longest time, lots of opportunity to, to do good engineering to optimize. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is becoming extraordinarily important with the many cores. Yep. Because as soon as you have a thousand cores on your, on, on, on your chip, the world has changed. The programmer who writes the program now knows nothing about the environment in which it runs. It yep. doesn't know what the load is. It doesn't know how many cores there are. It doesn't know what its priority is. It knows nothing. So that the code now has to be written at this higher level of abstraction so it can be adapted at runtime to the current circumstances. Yep. So, so, so Clemens, I, I have a question for you to tie this because yep. you, you wrote a book on software components. Indeed. Yes. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and that book is also available on Amazon.com, yes. of course. Oh, of course. Let's, get it, let's get your name on here. So. Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so one of the things that, you know, um, what, 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 what I like about this model and, for example, what I don't see in a lot of the discussions about REST is that this really kind of, you know, gives you, it's like very kind of abstract, as, as Carl says, about what these things do, but they don't really talk, or how, how the mechanisms work, but they don't talk right. about anything about what happens inside, except for, you know, it can designate the what to do with the next message. So, is, whereas when you talk about software components, you talk much more about like the interfaces and the behavior of the kind of, you know, what happens inside. So, how does that relate? Um, is, uh, is that like you know a complementary view, or um, and in the in in your um, components you also talk about like callbacks and so on, which kind of you know has the same kind of you right, know, right. Um, notion of deadlock. Right. So can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that? Well, so I view actors as a computational model that okay. basically allows me to understand how things behaviorally unfold and come about. Um, and in that sense, I think it's orthogonal to theories of composition where you go and say, if I have two subsystems and I want them to interact in a way that I understand and perhaps only partially understand, what are systematic ways of constraining the composition, of predicting what would happen if I compose? Um, and I should be able to do this over many different computational models, actors being one of them. So, so that's a good question. So why, I mean, if I look at this, I think, you know, why would I ever want a different computational model? Because this to me has like, and, and I'm not saying that because Carl's here, but this, yeah. this is like, the, it's like, it's like, it's like a little bit like, you know, category theory. It's like, if yeah. you want to build something minimal, this is kind of all you need and nothing more and nothing less. So why would you? Uh, well, so I mean, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, right. that's a very good question, but there is a, there is a moment. Okay. We have to be careful. Because Gödel said exactly those same words about Turing's model of computation. He says, he said, and I quote this in my paper, this is the end. <laughs> Nobody could ever conceive, okay, of a model of computation beyond that of the Turing machine. Okay. This is Famous the end. Last Famous words. last words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Right. And, and, okay, and so, but, but, but there is an art to 
making programming languages for actors. I mean, yes, it's yeah. very easy to screw it up. You can screw it up by violating some of the fundamental principles. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and you can also screw it up by not taking them seriously yes. enough. For example, <laughs> uh, and there's a funny story here with respect to Dijkstra. There's a sense in which Dijkstra got it completely wrong. He wrote a famous paper, Go To Considered Harmful. Yep. From the actor point of view, the go-to is completely innocent. Yep. It's a parameterless procedure call. Yep. Okay, pure and simple, right? And we, we, we have the, the body yeah, right it's, there. It's, it's like designate the thing with the next no, message no, no, without no, no, doing no, no. something. Is that, is that also like a, different. Is, no. is that not the same as a go-to? That go is to not. Because that is not. Just nope, 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 nope. Nope. Oh, good. So we <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. no. Let me explain. Let me explain. Yeah, yeah. Explain more. Yeah, explain, explain more. more. Okay, right. Yes. So then I can explain the relationship. Yes. Okay. So, but there was a guilty party that the Dijkstra overlooked. The assignment command. That is the evil party if you're going to have something considered harmful. Because the assignment command in these many core systems is excru excruciatingly expensive. It can require a signal to go to the other side yes. of the chip, right? <laughs> For a global assignment command, which is just extraordinarily expensive. And maintaining all this state that you're multiplexing among the cores is also extraordinarily expensive. Okay. So what do you do in an actor system? Okay. Is this part this is where the this is where the assignment can't demand comes in. What you do is you're processing your message, you're purely functional, you're purely referentially transparent until you figure out what the response to this message is going to do. Then you say, ah, the, the answer is X, and then there's this thing called also, you see. So, so for example, for the checking yep. account, you say the answer is the balance, and also, also, the balance becomes the balance plus the deposit. Mm -hmm. But that's for the next guy. That's for the next message that comes. That's not for us. Yep. So throughout the, 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 the body of our message, balance is balance. So here we're returning the balance. It's expression-oriented language, so you don't have to say return. You return the balance. Also, you do perform the assignment. Yeah. And so, so what I meant is that if you do also with the same kind of value now, it's like you know you're you're doing like a tail recursive call, which is like a go-to. Um, but maybe I'm kind of <laughs> thinking too far. Uh, well, right. I'm not changing the states, but I'm well, just you, kind you, of. You know, but here we yes, are changing yes, the states. Yes, yes. But if if if, so, I don't, so that, if I don't change the balance, I wouldn't change the state. Right. So it's it's not a tail call because you're actually changing yes. the state, right? And um, because of optimizations, it's also not an event loop, which is the other way to misunderstand things. <laughs> Good. <laughs> now, another thing that yes. you talk a lot about is inconsistency. So I've been oh, yes, right. super yes, inconsistent. Kind of, you know, <laughs> right. that, yeah, yeah. So this is the uh, so so. Why is it important that we don't try to be consistent? or that we don't try to enforce consistency on right. our world? Well, the first problem issue is we can't. That we now have these large information systems, everybody's got them, it's starting with our operating systems, you know, whether it's iOS or Linux or Windows, we have these, or, 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 or SQL, where, where you work, we have these large software systems that are chock full of inconsistencies and we have these teams of programmers, sometimes numbering in, in the thousands, managing them and they have to be able to, to reason about this and think and you can't pretend that it's consistent because the program manager can open a drawer and says here's 10,000 what we are inconsistent we already know about okay so and, and and similarly on the internet the information out there is all inconsistent right and so talking about truth is just crazy yes it's, it's like is elf is alive or dead well the, the, well that's the <laughs> well that, that was the thing about schrodinger's cat yes. right right well, <laughs> the, the cat can be yeah. half dead, yes. right? I mean, you can you, because there was a, a, a cyanide in there, and it was supposed to be an alpha yeah. particle, right? You know, that the world, but but if the cyanide particle's gone off, and you reach in there, and and, and, and the cat only has a little bit of the cyanide, we can resuscitate the cat, okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there are things there are things that are clear that get pretty far up, but the fundamental situation is that we don't know much. 
and some of it's wrong. Yep. <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is the situation in which we find themselves. So it's kind of useless to deny it, okay, because then your emperor has no closed mode. And it's also kind of crazy to be in Darth Vader mode to think you're going to wipe them out because you can't do that either. Yep. So we have to have, and we had this 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 this, this symposium which you yep. came down and uh, participated in. Yes. Very nice. And then we should tell us where we can yes. download the proceedings. Right. Yes, yes, yes. So that is in uh, robust eleven dot org. Good. Yes. Yes. So so there's a the proceedings there and. Uh, uh, there's the and if you if you look it up, it's inconsistency. Mm -hmm. Robustness. Two thousand eleven. You'll find a web page, and there will be another one. And there will be another one inconsistency robustness in two thousand fourteen, and we're just about to post the call for papers for that one. Great. Now we have the ability to add text to these videos in the description, so. Okay, okay. yes. But I like the real-time effect, it's nice. Yep, yep, yep. Nice. okay. All right, so well, have, well thank I don't know, do you want to finish? Or yes, yes. yes. I have one more. One, okay, one yeah, yeah, good. Right. Go I, ahead. Have a I have a tail call. Um, I'm, I'm noticing that um, it seems like you are modeling local arbitration, but not global consensus. Um, and you're basically claiming global consensus would be an illusion because you can't really establish it. You would have mm -hmm. to freeze the universe, basically. Um, while local arbitration is something you can do, it is indeterminate, mm -hmm. but you can therefore locally come to a locally meaningful view of your world, but it may be completely different from anyone else's view of the world. That's right. And, and in fact, with respect to the other guys out there, all you know is what they told, uh, told you. And right. they, by the time the news gets to you, right, it could already have been, you know, they may not even exist anymore, yeah. much less the circumstances they're talking about. So you always have, from the other guys, you always have old news. And now, because of Moore's Law, old news can be on the other side of the same chip you're on. <laughs> <laughs> so local is very local. Very local. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yes. yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Clemens, Carl. Um, and I hope that, you know, everybody now kind of, you know, really deeply understands what actors are. Carl has a whole bunch of papers on his uh, website. Um, and um, maybe we'll see um, more about this. Thank you so much. And um, this was wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Yes. Thank you very much.